Okay, so we're gonna get started here. Um, good afternoon, my name is Claire McLaughlin. I am the Assistant Director of Financial Aid here at Salus University. We're just gonna be talking about general financial aid process today. Um, what you should know before we really begin is that the financial aid process from undergrad to grad is very similar. The process is pretty much exactly the same. The outcome is different, um, and because the outcome is a little different, it's actually much easier for you to know what you're gonna be eligible for or not eligible for before you even get here, before you even really apply, because the vast majority of aid on the grad level is not needs based but we'll get into it and I'll, I'll get you more information as we begin. So this is just our contact information. Obviously, this information is also on the website, so please feel free to email us, call us, as questions come to you as you start working on your process for financial aid, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, so how are you eligible for federal financial aid? Well, you need to make kind of the regular requirements. So first of all, if you were eligible in undergrad, you know that you're gonna be eligible still, or you should still be eligible on the grad level. These sorts of regular requirements are, um, you need to be a US citizen or an eligible non-citizen. You need to have a valid social security number. Um, you need to be enrolled or accepted for enrollment as a regular student in an eligible degree or certificate program. You need to be at least half time. If you're looking at one of our cohort programs, then you're good, that, that satisfies that requirement. Uh, you need to um, make satisfactory academic progress. Um, you need to um, not be in default with any former federal loans. That's really important. You can't be in default and then um, be borrowing more money from the federal government. And you need to show that you're qualified to obtain a college or career school education by having a high school diploma or a recognized equivalent, such as a general educational development, like a GED certificate. Basically, you need to show that you've completed other types of schooling, which again, you would have already done with your admissions process. So that is usually taken care of. Okay, so what documents are you going to need for financial aid? Well, you're going to need to apply for the FAFSA. Now, the FAFSA the last few years has been available on October 1st. This year, the FAFSA is changing and um, it, it is simplifying. And as such, with these big changes that are coming to the FAFSA, the federal government is not releasing it until December 1st, 2023. So again, the FAFSA for 24 25 will not be available until December 1st, 2023. If you've filled out the FAFSA before, you will probably get um, a reminder email from them at that time when it opens. Um, so just one thing to keep in mind that it's gonna be open a little bit later than usual this year. You'll also need to complete a direct unsubsidized loan, master promissory note. You'll also have to do entrance counseling for graduate students. You should not do those uh, any sooner than April 15th, 2024. And quite frankly, I would suggest that you wait even a little bit later to do those. Um, I usually tell my students to wait until a little farther into the summer to do all those documents at one time. And I can tell you as we continue with this presentation or um, during the year, when's a better time to do those. I just wanna make sure that you're completing those documents at a time when they make sense for you and at a time when you can complete them all at once and get all that documentation you need. Again, that's not the FAFSA, it's the other documentations that's needed for your loans. And if you don't plan on taking aid, please email our office. Um, if you don't plan on taking federal loans, there's really no reason to submit the FAFSA. Uh, so you can also skip that step as well. Okay, optional documents, the work study request form. That'll be posted on the MySalus portal in spring of 2024. That is necessary to request Work study. Yes, you need to have a FAFSA on file, but you also need to submit a work study request form to my office as well. We use that form to know who is truly looking for work study and we get some other information that we need to get you packaged with that. You'll also want to apply for the Graduate Plus loan. If you, that's something you're looking for, that loan has its own application and that's not available until after April 15th. And again, I'm gonna talk a little later about when it makes sense to apply for that loan. Um, if you are planning on using it, you really shouldn't apply until um, later in the summer. And that Graduate PLUS loan will also require its own master promissory note. Okay, so here are the types of financial aid that you can expect. The main source of your uh, federal 
aid as a graduate student is going to be the direct unsubsidized loan. So for our students in uh, going into the optometry major, you're going to be eligible for $40,500 in direct unsubsidized student loan funding in your first year. All of our other programs are going to be eligible for $20,500 in direct unsubsidized student loan funding your first year. Uh, if you're looking at the scholars program, you'll actually be eligible for $43,833 your first year, again, in the direct unsubsidized student loan funding. On the um, screen, you can see what the interest rate is until uh, June of next year. Most of you, the rate will have changed by the time you get here. Um, that information is always posted on studentaid.gov, and it's also posted on the MySalus portal. You'll also see that there's a loan fee posted there. That is because all of the direct loans have a origination fee associated with them. This means a portion of the loan comes off the top at disbursement and it goes towards the servicing of your loan. So you are receiving less funding than what you are actually borrowing. So just keep that in mind. Uh, interest accrues while, this, while you're in school for this loan and repayment begins six months after dropping below at least half time. For our optometry students, you might be eligible for the health profession student loan. This loan is not from the Department of Education, it's from the Department of Health and Human Services. You need to include your parental information on the FAFSA to be considered for this loan. There is no interest while you're in school with this loan. The interest rate is set at 5% once it starts repayment, and repayment begins one year after dropping below at least half time. Again, this is only available for my students who are pursuing optometry. It is not available to other majors. The Graduate PLUS loan. The Graduate PLUS loan is the additional loan from the federal government that you might use to uh, finance the rest of your tuition and your living expenses. Uh, this, as we talked about earlier, requires an additional application. You're going to apply for a specific amount in this loan based on your own needs. I suggest that you wait a little farther into the summer to apply for this loan because at that point you might have a better idea of when your, what your, pardon me, what your uh, living expenses are going to look like. So it's really important that you wait to apply for this loan Again, it's probably sometime next summer. Yes, it'll open in April, but most of you won't know what your living situations will look like by that time. So you wanna wait until you have an idea as to how much you actually need to borrow so that you're borrowing at a time that it makes sense that you know how much you're borrowing. If you aren't interested in uh, federal loans, you might be interested in private education loans. If you go to Elm Select, you can look up our school's profile there and you can look at uh, alternative loans that our students have had success with in the past. Uh, interest rates are going to differ by lender and they may be fixed or variable. It's all going to be based on um, your application with them and what kind of products they offer. It's uh, usually also based on your credit score and oftentimes your parents' credit score. So you want to keep that in mind when you're thinking about what you're looking for. You're also more than likely going to need a co-signer for a private education loan. You will not need a co-signer for any of the federal loans. So that's something you want to keep in mind. Other financial aid that you might be eligible for, federal work study. As I said earlier, you need to submit that work study request form if you're interested in work study. Uh, it's based on financial needs. So again, you do have to have the FAFSA on file, but you also have to submit that financial aid request form that will be available next spring. So keep that in mind if you're interested in work study. It pays $15 an hour. There's a variety of opportunities to work on campus and students can work up to 20 hours per week. You will, uh, if you are interested in work study, you'll get a job on campus and you will truly work for that funding. So every two weeks you would get paid based on the amount of hours that you worked in that pay period. Scholarships, all accepted students are considered for deans and provost scholarships, annually awarded endowed scholarships available for some programs, external opportunities available you can visit uh, our website and look for the scholarship information for more details there. The um, accepted scholarships are, th th I'm so, so sorry, uh, the scholarships that are available for our um, accepted students come from admissions, so just keep in mind that you'll get that information from them and not my office. Okay, and types of financial aid. So again, as I said, for the federal, for the direct unsubsidized loan, First year optometry students are going to be eligible for 40,500. First year optometry scholar students are going to be 
eligible for $43,833. All of my other graduate programs are going to be eligible for $20,500. Again, the re rest of our programs are going to be eligible for $20,500, and all of those are per award year. The health profession student loan is going to vary. Again, it's based on need. Again, you need to include your parental information on the FAFSA if you are interested in applying for that. And again, it's for my optometry students only. So that's any of the optometry programs, uh, both the traditional and the scholars. Uh, that award averages around $4,500, but again, it's gonna vary based on financial need. Work study is available for all programs except the post -back. Uh, It's between usually $720 to, this is $3,800, but it can really go up farther than that depending on how many hours you request. And the Graduate PLUS loans and the private education loans are gonna be up to the cost of attendance minus any other aid. So you can borrow up to the max cost of attendance that's posted for uh, your year in program. Budgets can be found um, on the MySalus portal, but all that bud budget information is available on the Salus website as well. So you can see what students' budgets look like this year if you're interested. Tuition does normally increase from year to year from about two to 6%, but if you look at this year's budgets, you're gonna get a pretty good idea of how much things are gonna cost next year. Okay, so what are the educational costs that you can borrow for? Excellent question. Your cost of attendance consists of tuition, fees, books and instruments, so you can borrow for that. Computer allowance, only if you're an optometry student because that is the only program that technically a computer is required for. If you have a computer of your own when you go into the program and you don't need a new one, you do not need to borrow for that, but you can borrow for that if you want. You wouldn't be buying that from the school. And you can also cover living expenses. So living expenses would include room, board, transportation costs, health insurance, miscellaneous expenses. Obviously, these expenses are going to vary from student to student. So when I was speaking earlier about applying for other loan funding to finance the rest of your educational costs, it's really important that you determine how much you specifically need when it comes time to apply for this loan. Everyone's gonna have different expenses, so you should all be applying for different loan amounts. The only thing that's gonna be the same between you and your neighbor is the tuition and fees, uh, but other than that, it's all gonna be very different. Uh, tuition and fees, again, are listed on the website and the cost of attendance are there as well. The Just so that you know, as a something to keep in mind, is that the living expense allowance ends up being about $2,900 a month. Now, you're not going to receive funding each month, you're going to receive a refund at the time of disbursement if you are borrowing more than what's needed to satisfy your direct cost with the university, but it ends up being around $2,900 a month. So that's just a good figure to keep in mind when you're uh, looking for um, places to live next year. You wanna make sure that you're well below that because that's gonna be not just your room and board, obviously, that's gonna be everything. Okay, so what is the financial aid timeline for when you can expect to hear things from my office? Again, great question. So uh, spring of your entering year, so we're talking about spring of 2024, uh, students that are deposited or matriculated are emailed with a list of required financial aid documents and a deadline for this, of their submission. Around June and July of your entering year, so again, we're talking June and July of 2024 for most of you, awarding will begin. And then uh, the disbursement schedule for is always going to follow um, the academic calendar in terms of um, semesters or terms. So uh, next year, many of you are just going to be here in fall and spring. So you would get one disbursement in August and one disbursement in January. If you are um, a scholar student, so you'll be on the quarter calendar right away, you would get a disbursement um, in July, actually, and then you would get another disbursement in fall, another disbursement in winter, and another disbursement in spring, and that would be August, November, February. So again, here's just a rundown of the process. You need to submit your financial aid documents. You'll be awarded and notified of financial aid. 
you'll have um, a few days or weeks even to review your offer, make sure that it's correct for you, make sure it's appropriate for you, make sure it looks the way that you want it to work. And um, you can send us any loan changes or reductions if you need to um, at that time. Uh, loans will then be processed. And again, when disbursement comes, which for our students that we're talking to right now, um, that would be August of 2024 would be our fall disbursement. Those loans would be processed. They would be posted to your account. Any funds that are owed to the school are uh, subtracted. And then any of the remaining funds after um, your cost of the school or finance are going to be returned to you via a refund. That refund is what you're going to use for any living expenses or other education related expenses. So even those of you who might not be um, getting an apartment or things like that, you still might want to think about whether you'll need a refund to cover things like gas or lunch, things like that when you are commuting. Okay, so just some good things to know. Uh, as you have probably figured out, graduate student financial aid consists mostly of loans and it's mostly non-needs based. Living expense refunds are not available until after the first week of classes in your first term, so keep that in mind. Moving and relocation expenses are the responsibility of the student and are not included in the living expense budget, so you won't see that there. Loan funds will not be available for department excuse me, apartment deposits required prior to the first disbursement. Again, loan funds will not be available for apartment deposits required prior to the first disbursement. Any expenses which exceed the cost of attendance will need to be funded by other means. That means savings, family, friends, personal bank loans, et cetera. Things to keep in mind if you are a um, foreign student. Um, if you are Canadian, you might want to check with your province. We have many Canadian students who get funding from their province's Ministry of Education. That process would start with you. You'd get some paperwork. You'd send that paperwork to both uh, my office and the registrar's office, and we would get that paperwork together for you. Uh, private lenders, uh, some of our students find um, loans from the Royal Bank of Canada. Oftentimes this looks like a line of credit, um, but you will again need to look into this um, more deeply yourself. Um, some US banks will lend to uh, Canadian or foreign students if they have a credit worthy US co-signer. So if you do have family or friends in the US who are willing to co-sign for you, you might wanna look into that as well. That might be a good option for you. Also, just so you know, Canadian and foreign students are considered for the Salus scholarship. So the Dean and Provost scholarship that I mentioned earlier, you will be considered for. That's not just for our US students. Students will need to provide proof of funding for their entire program cost, including living ex expenses to obtain a student visa. That's super important, but you'll also get more information from admissions about the I-20 process. So don't worry about that too much right now. They should be helping you with that. One of the things we always try to tell our students is to make sure you are checking your email. Um, my office and every other office on campus is gonna contact you via your Salus email address once you get it. You're going to get your Salus email address about three to four weeks after you deposit. And then once you get that Salus email address, that's how all communications are gonna go. That's how I'm gonna send out your financial offers. That's how I'll let you know if any documents are missing or if we have questions about your FAFSA et cetera, et cetera. So it's really important that you get into the habit of checking that email in the beginning about once a week, as we get closer and closer to summer and uh, fall start, you need to be checking that more and more often. Also, you can go to studentaid.gov for more information. Studentaid.gov is gonna be where you complete a lot of the documentation that we talked about today, and it also has a wealth of information. So I encourage you to check it out. Okay, so that is my presentation. At this point, does anybody have any questions for me? And you can feel free to go into the chat if you do, and I can help you out there.
Okay. It looks like I don't have any questions, so I am going to um, end this here. Thank you so much for coming today and listening to my presentation. Again, if you have further questions while you're uh, working through all this, please email um, financialaidatsalis.edu and uh, me or one of the other counselors on staff will be happy to help you with any questions you might have. Thank you so much and have a great afternoon.